All right. Hello, everybody. OK, the announcements for today are turn off your cell phone, please. Please turn off your cell phone. OK, great. Uh, there's no more Wisdom Wednesdays. Uh, the annual meeting is Monday, May 20th. I'm sure you've all heard that announcement like 15 times by now, but uh, I just would like to mention that indeed we have the art fair at 9 to 10, and then from a 10 to 11 is the uh, 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 Ali member uh, meeting. So it's usually a lot of fun. I know I'm always there, so maybe I'll do some you know tricks or something. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I also noticed that the um, Class um, evaluations are available. Um, if you enjoy this class, please fill it out. If you don't enjoy this class, don't. No, no, no. No, <laughs> but, uh, no if, you, if, you, if there's something I can do better, please feel free to, to write that down. I certainly would be glad. But if, again, I do appreciate those of you that will give me positive reviews, because quite honestly, who doesn't like that? Uh, anyway, the Ali American Theater Players are having a reading from American Plays, Our Town by Thornton Wilder, Seal Magnolias by Robert Harling, Three Tall Women by Edward Albee, and then Selected Vignettes from Neil Simon. That will be uh, Tuesday, May 14th, and that will be from 11.50 to 12.30 at the wonderful Auburn Church of Christ. And that will be in the Education Annex classroom. And it's all about your entertainment. So please feel free to, to do that, and it uh, sounds like a lot of fun. OK. Today, we're going to talk about USC and air power against Japan. And this is a um, uh, very, there are parts of this class that are less than pretty. I'll say that uh, straight out. So, uh, but indeed, we had a significant amount of fighting going on that was relatively different uh, than anything that had been seen before, particularly in Asia. And it starts with one of my favorite topics, which is War Plan Orange. OK, War Plan Orange dates from 1906. It was originally designed to be uh, a Mahanian type of fleet battle. In other words, the US battleship fleet would march across the Pacific and uh, fight the Japanese. At that time in 1906, uh, every ship available really was coal powered. And coal power ships don't have a lot of range, so you would need to have stepping stone bases across the Pacific. Well, as it turns out in World War II, this doesn't change very much. Because what happens is, is we are going to now use the same idea because of tactical air power. So there's two different changes from 1906. The first big change, of course, is air power. There was no air power in 1906. And the other issue is the submarine. The submarine had been used previously, but it was certainly in a, uh, an infant state. So the submarine and air power are big changes to this. Well. The War Plan Orange, which was our Navy's plan really throughout World War II, in fact, is not about invading Japan. It's about blockading Japan. So what we're going to do is we're going to deny their access to resources in the hope that they will eventually surrender. So we want to capture island bases, like I said, but they also wanted to capture specific island bases close to that. That would be uh, Okinawa. Formosa, which we know today is being Taiwan. And they also wanted to have a landing on the Chinese mainland. And this way they could get close to Japan and blockade it and prevent them from getting any natural resources. As we discussed in a previous class, Douglas MacArthur lobbied with uh, President Roosevelt indeed to have the Philippines invaded. And he lobbied successfully, and indeed the US did invade the Philippines, which was never really part of the Navy's plan. So when we invaded the Philippines, the big benefit we got was we could still cut off the natural resource area. And of course, the big benefit that MacArthur got was he could claim that I have returned. Notice he didn't say we have returned. I have returned. So 
One thing about Doug, he was never very shy about self-promoting. So the Navy never has any plans, even late in the war, for a direct invasion of Japan. They want to win the war strictly by blockade. Well, as I said, the submarine was never part of this plan in 1906, but it certainly becomes part of the plan later on. So the Japanese, it's an island nation. They have a need for supplies. They don't have a lot of natural resources. So they need to get 8 to 10 million tons of shipping, of ships, to bring in what they need on a yearly basis to supply the Japanese homeland with food and oil, et cetera. Well, they don't have 8 to 10 million tons of ships to start the war. They actually have 6 million tons. <coughs> so much of their shipping is done by third parties, the US, for example. Uh, they do capture about 700,000 tons of shipping early in the war when they take Southeast Asia. So they do get a significant amount. And they are building ships throughout this time. They're not building a lot, not anything like what we're building, but they're building cargo ships on a, on a regular basis. So the US has got a very cautious plan for our submarines. Um, when they have a war game, uh, they would, if you have a submarine and your periscope is sighted by a war game umpire, your submarine is automatically declared destroyed. So just the fact that they see your periscope means you're out of the game. So this starts to make our submarine commanders very, very cautious. Another thing they do is they are so cautious that they don't fire torpedoes necessarily by raising their periscope and seeing the target. Now, Maybe I should explain a little bit about torpedoes at this time. Torpedoes at this time are not smart. They don't have the capability to track a target. It's kind of like shooting a gun. You, it's just going to, once you fire it, it's basically just going to go in a straight line. It's not going to track a target or you can't maneuver it. They could do a little bit of offline shooting with a torpedo data computer, which is an analog computer, but realistically, these torpedoes are basically, you shoot them and that's the line they're going to go on. So what they begin to do, is because they're so paranoid, is they begin to use a hydrophone. So they don't raise their periscope. They can listen to where they think the ships are and just sort of fire torpedoes in that general direction. That's not a particularly good plan to get hits, particularly with a weapon that's not smart. So really, really very cautious methodology. Now, Submarine captains that we have, therefore, before the war are relatively timid, but we do, as the war progresses, get submarine commanders that are anything but timid. Yes? On the previous slide, I explained the notion of the concept of a ship tonnage. Okay, I can just do it. All right, the question is explain the concept of ship tonnage. Okay. I think what you're saying, Bill, is that you want to know that in order for, you have to have so many ships, so many tons of ships in order to be uh, able to maintain your economy. So let's say you have a ship that weighs 10,000 tons. So you would need, for the Japanese economy in the 19, late 30s, early 40s, you would need 8 million to 10 million tons of ships. So that would be literally thousands of ships. The physical weight of the ship. All right, the question was again, are we talking about the, the amount that they carry or no, they, it's the talking about they need that many tons of ships, not that many tons of supplies. They need actually quite a bit more than that. So the pre-war doctrine for our uh, submarine fleet was that they were to be the eyes of the fleet, so they were to do reconnaissance. They were to perhaps cause damage to the enemy fleet, uh, to whittle it down, reduce the numbers so that then there would be a large fleet engagement between the battleship forces. And that's a continuation, really, of the Mahanian idea. So, uh, that, but the Japanese actually had the same doctrine. Again, 
Their thinking was, as we marched across the Pacific in War Plan Orange, that what they would do is they would use their submarines and their air power to whittle our fleet down, make it smaller so then they could defeat the fleet of ours somewhere off the coast of Japan. That was always their plan. <clears throat> so, the U.S. had condemned in World War I, particularly in World War II, the use of submarines to sink enemy cargo ships in what they refer to as unrestricted warfare. So that would mean that you can fire at an enemy ship from underwater, they don't see you, and you sink them. By the laws of the sea at that time, realistically today as well, you were supposed to stop a merchant ship and let the crew get off and then destroy it. That was the rules. The Germans didn't play by those rules and in April of 1917 we went into World War I basically over that concept. So what happens here though is Admiral Stark, six hours after Pearl Harbor, decides to declare unrestricted warfare on the Japanese. Uh, and did not really consult the U.S. government in this regard. Of course, the U.S. government was all in favor for it, really. But we had basically said, we're not going to do this, and then six hours after the war starts, indeed, we begin to do that. So, uh, you can see there's a little less than honesty in that regard. So, uh, the U.S. have seen how in World War I and World War II, the German use of unrestricted submarine warfare has nearly choked off supplies to Britain. And we think this is a great idea. We're going to choke off supplies. The Navy's always been their plan. But we're going to choke off supplies to Japan. And the Japanese, though, never really adopt this plan. The Japanese continue to, they would, yes, they sank U.S. cargo ships. But they didn't sink U.S. cargo ships as something they were trying to do. If they stumbled across one, they would attack it. But they weren't making it a, a regular plan to do such. <coughs> so, the U.S. is going to try to protect the Philippines, as we talked about in my other class. Uh, and one of the big things they're going to use to protect the Philippines from Japanese invasion is a submarine force, a very strong submarine force. In fact, the largest submarine force stationed outside the United States. I believe there were 27 U.S. submarines based in Manila. So this is a large number of submarines. They completely fail to stop the Japanese invasion of the Philippines. The question is why? And the question why is, is the biggest scandal perhaps ever in U.S. military history, and that is the Mark 14 torpedo. When you talk about a bad torpedo, that's a bad torpedo. How bad is it? Well, it runs too deep. So if you fire at a ship, it runs way underneath it and doesn't hit the ship. It also has a thing called a magnetic exploder. The idea of this is the ships have a magnetic field and you fire a torpedo just underneath it and then the torpedo goes off and it creates a water hammer to break the back of the ship. Now that's a great idea when you're attacking warships because warships are armored. So that idea is a great idea if you can get it to work. Unfortunately, we never even get close to getting it to work and the magnetic exploder is a complete, total failure. Now, <laughs> there's, there's all these problems, and the people that take the blame on, oh, one more problem is, uh, this is a good one, the contact piece, so basically there's the magnetic exploder, but there's also an exploder if the, the torpedo hits dead onto the ship, and that contact piece is from the Mark 10 torpedo. Well, the Mark 10 torpedo is significantly slower than the Mark 14. So what happens is, is when this thing hits, it hits too hard, it crushes the contact piece, so it pinches it. And so consequently, the contact piece can't make contact to set off the explosives. So if you hit an enemy ship dead on with a Mark 14 torpedo with the contact pin, the contact pin does not function, 
and the torpedo does not explode. Now, interestingly, if the torpedo hits on a little angle, like a bad shot, really, then it will not fracture and it will explode. So this causes, uh, people don't understand why sometimes it blows up, sometimes it doesn't, and, it, and the people that are taking the blame for this thing are the submarine commanders that the U.S. is saying that you guys are just basically not competent and are const you're just, you're, you're not getting hits. It can't be the torpedo's fault. Well, so that's the, the three issues with the torpedo. The other biggest issue is, is Admiral Christie. Admiral Christie is stationed in Australia and he is one of the people that designed the magnetic exploder. So he feels confident that his thing that he built can't possibly be the problem, and he orders his submarine commands, because there's two separate commands. There's a command in Hawaii and there's a command in, uh, in Australia. He orders all his guys to keep using the magnetic exploders regardless, and some of them basically sail off and turn them off and just say, hey, we used them. But um, <laughs> the biggest issue with this is they didn't test this pro thing properly. So we never really tested the Mark 14 torpedo in any sort of reasonable way. They fired it a couple of times. Torpedoes were expensive. They didn't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, they didn't actually use them to explode. They would just sail under a ship and they would assume that it went off. And, they were, and the other problem is because of the magnetic fields of the Earth, that changes things, uh, how these people, these torpedoes react. So the biggest issue that is, is when, so you fire a magnetic exploder, it goes under the ship, it doesn't go off. Sometimes they would go just before the ship and go off. So either way, the ship isn't damaged. And again, with the contact exploder, we get the same issue. They're just not going off. It takes a significant amount of time to figure out all these problems, and we actually do, by September of 1943. So in fact, the war has been going on for almost two years before we fix this problem. That's not good. Well, we did have cautious commanders, but as I said, we had a new breed of commanders coming on. And one of those people, who's probably the epitome of this breed, is a man called Mush Morton. Uh, by the way, Mush was from the South, and when he was at Annapolis, because of his uh, extreme Southern accent, they referred to him as Mushmouth. So that's how he got the name Mush. Now, how aggressive is Mush? He was going to be told to take his submarine, the Wahoo, to Wheelock Harbor off New Guinea, and he was to do a reconnaissance of the harbor, which the assumption would be that he would sit outside the harbor, harbor and count the ships as they went in and out and maybe attack one or two. Mush, on the other hand, thought, Perhaps the best thing to do if I really want to do a reconnaissance of this harbor is to sail into the harbor underwater and see what's going on in there. Well, unfortunately, in a way, his periscope is sighted, and the next thing the mush knows is there's a Japanese destroyer with what they refer to as a bone in its teeth. That means it's coming full speed and it's got a big wake. Coming right at him. It's roaring out of this harbor. What does Mush do? He says, hmm, maybe we'll just try to shoot a torpedo straight at the bow of that ship because maybe we could sink it doing this. Now, that's not exactly a recipe for success, okay? It's not easy to hit the front of a ship with a, a torpedo that's not smart. So he fires a torpedo, it misses. He fires another torpedo, it misses. This destroyer is getting closer and closer. And he fires one more torpedo. And again, because that doesn't hit straight on, the contact mechanism of the Mark 14 actually works, and he sinks that destroyer in the middle of Weewalk Harbor. This is a pretty gritty guy. Okay? This isn't your average kind of person. The other thing with these new people, these new captains of these submarines, is they're kind of like fighter pilots. A fighter pilot in this era needed to go in close Get, his, get locked on that target and make sure he got hits. That's how you're going to score a kill. Submarines are the same way. You've got to go in close. You've got to take chances. You've got to get hits. 
and much wasn't afraid to do that. <coughs> the U.S. also began to install radar on its submarines. Another key thing, because the submarine underwater is kind of like a, uh, a slightly movable minefield. Submarines are very slow underwater. They can only go at this time maybe seven knots tops, but if you did that, you'd be using a lot of battery. So you'd probably be running at about three knots underwater. Well, cargo ships are faster than that. They're going roughly 10 knots. So you have to basically get in front of them underwater to be where you need to be to shoot at them. With radar, you could go at night on the surface, be out of range of their sight, keep track of them, and a submarine on the surface can go 18 to 19 knots. So it's faster than a cargo ship. So you could run ahead of them easier, and you could do one of two things. You could do a night surface attack, or you could submerge and attack them when they got to you. So the radar is a huge, huge advantage. The other thing is the U.S. cryptologists, once again, we talk about these guys a lot, they did a fantastic job in World War II. They have broken the Japanese merchant marine code and they know exactly where all the Japanese uh, convoys are going. So they can send our submarines to exactly the right place. Well, the Japanese, for several reasons, probably the biggest reason is it's not exactly uh, enhancing to your career to be an anti-submarine officer. It's enhancing to your career to be on a battleship or on a carrier or on a ship that's used to attack. But a ship that's used for defense is not career enhancing for you. And you'll see later on too that mine clearing is not an enhancing thing. So they don't get their best people. They don't put a lot of resources into this. And what happens then is they never really develop a robust anti-submarine te 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 technology like the United States does and the British do. Again, we were planning to fight the Germans. The Germans were uh, actually a tougher submarine opponent than the Japanese ever were. They had better submarines. So the other piece with this is the Japanese don't really have the resources to build enough carriers and, and destroyers and things that they need just to maintain their fleet. They don't have the capability to expend a lot of energy and time and money in building anti-submarine ships as well, like destroyer escorts. So that's another piece that they just can't afford to do this kind of thing. <coughs> uh, by the way, that is a periscope view of the Nitsu Maru uh, that was sunk by the Wahoo. Um, in the war, the number one killer of Japanese merchant ships are submarines. They take out 55% of all Japanese merchant ships sunk during World War II. How many was that? They sank 1,300 ships with over 4.65 million tons. So they were extremely effective uh, killers. They sank 200 Japanese warships, including numerous carriers, cruisers, a couple of battleships uh, were sunk by uh, late in the war by submarines. And by the end of 43, the Japanese are so short of merchant ships because they can't build fast enough to keep up with the amount of losses that they're having that they have now got to station their battle fleet by Brunei. Well, you're saying, why do they do that? The reason they're stationing their battle fleet by Brunei is they can, the oil in Brunei is good enough, just barely, that you could take it right out of the ground and put it into the boiler of a World War II ship. It's not particularly good for the boiler, but you can do it. So they were so short of capability to bring oil to Japan to maintain their industries that they decided that they would, didn't have any excess capacity for their battle fleet, so they actually stationed their battle fleet by Brunei so that they wouldn't have to waste fuel because they just can't ship enough because they've lost so many tankers. Well, being a submariner is, is dangerous work. That's the, the best way I can, I can put this. Um, that 
we had 288 submarines of those during World War II, 52 are lost. And you can see this picture of the uh, Wahoo. This is on their last patrol. They did not return. They all, every, no survivors uh, on the Wahoo. Uh, so you captain, yes, Mush was still the commander. Uh, they, they found the wreck actually about five or six years ago. Uh, it's right off Japan. Uh, he, they believe it was sunk by aircraft. So um, 42 of the submarines are sunk by the Japanese, even with their limited capabilities. And two of them are blamed on circular torpedo runs. Now, how do we know that? Well, the second in command of the Wahoo at the time Mush I was describing was a man named O'Kane. Now, O'Kane was promoted to uh, captain of the submarine, the USS Tang. And he had fired a torpedo, an electric torpedo, a newer version that we had copied from the Germans. We had captured a German torpedo and, and copied it. And what happened with that torpedo is when he fired it at the Japanese ship, it made a circular run, came back and hit his submarine. There's two times they believe that it happened during World War II. Uh, the reason we know that is it was a night surface attack, so Kane and six other men were on deck. They survived and were captured by the Japanese. So O'Kane is a highly decorated commander as well. The Tang was one of the top submarines. And actually, after the war, O'Kane is given the uh, Medal of Honor. But he was not given the Medal of Honor during the war because he was a captive of the Japanese and they didn't want to do that. But uh, Mush, Martin, Mush Morton also received the uh, Medal of Honor. So approximately 16,000 sailors made war patrols on our submarines. Out of those, 3,500 did not return. U.S. submarines have the highest percentage of casualties of any service in World War II from the U.S. The German submarines had the highest number of casualties of any service of any country in World War II. So being a submariner is extremely, extremely hazardous duty. And these are very brave people. There's no question of that that uh, to, to do the kinds of things that they had to do uh, to, to get hits with their primitive equipment. Uh, I find it very sad to see this picture personally, but uh, I do honor these people that uh, they made a tremendous contribution to our victory. How many were in one of those crews? Uh, on a US submarine? I believe it was about 75. I've been inside of a submarine and they are tiny. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they're tight. I mean, I've been in the U-505 in Chicago numerous times. Uh, yeah, and they had a crew of about 80 on, on a Type 9 German U-boat. But I think that we had about 75 was our normal amount of people on a submarine. Yes? Did the average sailor uh, volunteer for submarines, or were they just assigned? Yes, they were volunteers. The silent service was a volunteer organization. OK? All right. Air power against the home islands. Uh, you can see the B-29 here. I actually had someone ask me a question when I taught this class previously. What is all that stuff around the B-29s? Well, just in case you don't know, all those little dots are bombs coming out of B-29s. So they drop a lot of bombs. So. Let's just take a second here and let's look at this aircraft, okay? That is a German Heinkel 111 that is flying over London. Please note the wing on that aircraft, how different that wing is. It's thick and short compared to the wing on a B-29. It is fairly obvious to someone that understands aeronautics that that plane is not meant for high speed, long range, and high altitude, not with that type of wing. So the official policy during World War II for the US and for many other powers as well originally was a thing called precision bombing. So you're going to target not the bulk of a city, but specific areas near a city or a sample. For example, a ball bearing factory. So that was the thinking, that we would do 
precision bombing. And it wouldn't be indiscriminate bombing of citizens, uh, civilians, etc. cetera. Uh, before our entry into World War II, Roosevelt and the administration pleaded with uh, world powers, all the belligerents, that they refrain from area bombing. Uh, only military targets should be bombed. And in the early part of World War II in Europe, please note, in Europe, that indeed, during what was referred to as the phony war between France and Britain and Germany, this was somewhat adhered to. There was not, really the Germans didn't start bombing cities of the, those people, keep that in mind, before uh, the May 10th of 1940 when they invaded France and of course then they bombed the center of Rotterdam, which was an exactly, the Dutch probably didn't think too much of that. But they did do that kind of thinking there. Now, that didn't exactly happen worldwide. Uh, area bombing actually predates World War I, the first bombing in history. Anybody know? Who did the first bombing in history? Yes. Italy. Yes, it was the Italy. And where did they bomb? Ethiopia. Libya. 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 They bombed the Turks. And the first bombing was by the Italians. It was in 1911, and they bombed Turkish positions in Libya. Of course, the Germans in World War I bombed London and many other British towns, but it wasn't particularly effective using zeppelins and the primitive aircraft that were available at that time. <coughs> After World War I, the British thought that it might be a good economy idea to police the colonies using aircraft. So, for example, if a tribesman in India got out of line, you would send a bunch of bombers over, drop some bombs on the town, and hopefully they would get back in line. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, it's, it's pretty funny, really, today. But, uh, so the Axis powers, like I said, the phony war was a different story. The Axis powers actually perfected area bombing the Italians in Abyssinia, Previous, just previous to World War II. Uh, the uh, Germans in the Spanish Civil War bombed Guernica, the very famous painting by Pablo Picasso. Guernica. When was Guernica? Guernica. Oh, Guernica? Guernica. I, my Spanish is lousy, so is my Japanese. Still Guernica. Guernica, okay. <laughs> Looks like Guernica to me, but whatever. Uh, and then, of course, Chongqing, which is the American pronunciation of that word, which is not Chongqing. <laughs> so, but Chongqing, interestingly, was first bombed by the Japanese in 1938 and was continuously bombed until 1944. And they indiscriminately bombed, and the civilian casualties in Chongqing were believed to be between 10 and 15,000 Chinese killed by the Japanese bombing. Now, we look at this wing of a Lancaster over Hamburg. You can see that the wing is getting thinner and longer. So you can see this aircraft was designed to have longer range, carry more bombs, and hopefully a little bit more altitude. The Lancaster was really not a high altitude bomber, but it did have good range and it could carry a big bomb load. Well, the British are going to try to do strategic air power. They're going to try to hit daylight targets using their aircraft that they're available. Well, bad news for them is the Luftwaffe is a little bit better than their aircraft, and the Luftwaffe massacres the British daylight raids. The British realize they cannot do this. They still want to use air power against Germany, so they decide they are going to begin to drop bombs at night. They don't really have that capability, though. So. Uh, they can't get the precision they need doing this. Uh, British bombers' results are pathetic at best. They do a study on bombing raids, and they find out that the vast majority of the bombs miss, and the ones that are probably close are landing about five miles away from the intended target. So they don't have the radar. They have radar, but it's not particularly good. 
They have other blind bombing, is what the term is, capability, but it's, again, it's not very good. So they can't hit a building. They can't hit a factory. They can hit the center of a city, maybe. Sometimes they actually bomb the wrong city. But, so the British come up with a thing they refer to as dehousing. Well, that's a friendly kind of term, isn't it? Hopefully you're not home when we dehouse you. But, so what they do is they decide what the capability they have is they can hit the city of Hamburg. And the reason they can hit Hamburg is because it's on the ocean, so they can see with their primitive radar the difference between the water and the land, and they can actually find Hamburg at night. Uh, the other problem with this, though, for, for Hamburg is it's been particularly hot and dry and it's windy. Those are bad, because what happens is a huge firestorm, and over a three-day period, 40,000 citizens of Hamburg die in the bombing. 1943. 1943, yes. So, the U.S. has had a long tradition of precision bombing. And it was done mainly by this gentleman here, General Billy Mitchell. And they feel that the most effective way to use bombers is to attack precision targets and destroy what is referred to as bottleneck targets. So they bring in industrialists and say, well, what's the most key component you have in your industry? And they start to identify key components. And if you could find, if those key components are only made in a couple of factories and they're difficult to make, if you can destroy those factories, you can shut down production for a lot of different things. For example, Oil refineries. There's not like an oil refinery on every corner, so if you can knock out all the oil refineries, if they can't refine the oil, they can't make aviation fuel, for example. Ball bearings are another bo bottleneck target. If you can knock out the ball bearing factories, you can limit production for many other things. <coughs> and they do this for, they begin to identify targets in Germany and Japan well before the war. So. Again, Billy Mitchell was a huge proponent of this strategy. One of the key people, really. But he also makes this statement. Well, you know, Japan's paper cities are perfect for incendiary bombing. So even Billy Mitchell, the main proponent of, of precision bombing, decides that this is not necessarily the best way to go. Well, the U.S. is totally committed to this, and we begin to build aircraft that are designed for this purpose. For example, we build the B-24 Liberator, the B-17 Bomber, and of course later the B-29. Uh, U.S. bombers have better bomb sites. They fly higher than British bombers. They are faster, and they are very heavily armed. They are meant to go into enemy territory and defend themselves. It doesn't always work out that way. Uh, we go to Germany and we begin to do things like attack the ball bearing factories and we take hideous losses. The Luftwaffe is pretty much capable of knocking down a lot of our bombers and making this to the point where we're beginning to think maybe we should not be doing this. Maybe we are going to have to go to night bombing the U.S. continues to persist with this. And then, finally, we develop long-range escort fighters, particularly the P-51. And with the P-51 and new tactics done by a man by the name of uh, General Jimmy Doolittle, who now lets the fighters fly out in front of the bombers, hunting German aircraft and breaking them up before. Originally, they kept the fighters close to the bombers to protect them. Doolittle says, no, that's the wrong thing to do. Let's let these guys go out and hunt, break up the Germans before they start to attack the bombers. And so that pays off two ways. So what's not said to the US public, though, is, is that it's incredibly cloudy in Europe 
a lot of days. And it's hard to use a bomb site that's a visual bomb site if it's clouds. So the US begins to bomb when it's cloudy using radar. And nearly, some depends on who you listen to. Some people say 55%, some people say just slightly less than 50%. Of all the bombs we dropped on Europe, the US dropped on Europe, were dropped by radar. So there was no visual, there was no precision bombing going on. That's a huge percentage. But we say that it's precision bombing, not area bombing. Well, the early efforts against Japan are started when Roosevelt in early 41 is convinced by Chinese lobbyists to give 500 aircraft to the Chinese nationalist government that is in war with Japan, uh, including uh, a significant portion of B-25 Mitchells. That's our latest medium bomber. At this time in, in China, China still has control of territory that's close enough to Kyushu, the southern Japan, that they can use a B-25 to get from China to bomb Kyushu and back. So he agrees to that, Roosevelt. Well, the US Air Force, Army Air Force, says, oh, this isn't probably a good idea. You know? uh, and Roosevelt also says, hey, you know what? We need to give them 500 pilots for these aircraft. And what I want you to do is I want you to let these pilots resign their commission and then become private contractors for the Chinese government. So they said, you know, look it, we're gearing up for war. We know war is coming. We really can't afford 500 aircraft and we really don't want to give up 500 pilots. But Roosevelt pretty much persists on this. And the feeling is, is that if they can get China to be powerful enough, perhaps it will distract Japan and keep them out of the war with the British and the Dutch, not to mention ourselves. So they send them 200 P-40Bs, which is the aircraft you see here today in uh, Flying Tiger livery, which means it has the shark mouth, the very famous American volunteer group. Uh, we sent them 66 A-20s and some Hudsons, but no B-25s. What most people don't realize about the AVG, or the American Volunteer Group, or as we call them, the Flying Tigers, is they did not fight the Japanese before Pearl Harbor. They actually did not get into battle until after Pearl Harbor. So there's always been this thinking that the, the Flying Tigers were fighting the Japanese way before we got into the war. That is not true. But the reason they're fighting is because Roosevelt wanted us to have, to help the Chinese, to help keep the Japanese basically busy. I think what we'll do right now is take a short break. So, uh, yes? Frank, uh, how many pilots did they send, and did they send any sort of ground support crew to go with those volunteers? I don't know the exact number of pilots, but yes, we did send enough pilots for all the aircraft, and the other thing is we did send complete ground c crews to be assist them as well. So they were paid by China? Everybody was paid by China. And you shot down a Japanese plane, you got a bonus. Like 500 bucks. It was a good bonus for back in 1941. Were those the ones that flew out of Burma into Kunming? Yep. Okay. This, this is flying the hump. No, these guys are not flying the hump. But the B-29s are. All right, so let's take a short break. Well, let's get back to work, because I got a lot of slides. You know, I'm I know you're shocked by that. So, uh, All right, so. The first B-29s indeed are deployed to China. And if you look at this B-29, you'll notice something different about it. It's painted green. When we look at B-29s generally, they're never painted green, they're painted silver. So this shows you that this is a very, very early example of the 29. Because again, our of drab was the standard uh, military color for uh, US aircraft. U.S. Army aircraft. 
the navy were blue. Um, and so these early B-29s began to deploy from the United States to India. And when they got to India, then they would fly shuttle flights into China. So, and the reason they did that was is a couple of things. The U.S. definitely wanted to support Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who was the nationalist Chinese leader, not Mao Zedong, the other guy. We don't talk about him too much. But they wanted to help Chiang, and they realized by this time of the war that they weren't going to need the B-29's very long-range capability in Europe, that England was not going to lose the war, and there was no need to worry about the fact that we would have to lose the English bases. So the B-17's and B-24's, et cetera, were fully capable of being deployed from Italy and from Britain to destroy the Third Reich. So the B-29 is now going to be exclusively used in the Pacific where it can use its extremely long range. So, as I mentioned when I talked about the design and the build of this aircraft, it was not a particularly reliable aircraft. Uh, like I had mentioned, the engines would overheat, the magnesium crankcase would catch fire, and the wing would burn off. On the first raid on Bangkok, that's the first, like a little test raid, you know, they were not going to go right after Japan, you got to get the, the units basically acclimated. So they tried to attack Bangkok, Thailand, and we lose five B-29s, none to Japanese defenses, because once again their engines caught fire and their wings burned off. Well, <coughs> what would happen with what the plan was is we would have the B-29s in India. We had the Chinese nationalist government build bases in China, and we would stage the planes in from India into China, and then they would be able to attack Kyushu, Japan, the southernmost island in Japan. So in order to get supplies to China, Everything is flown in over the Himalayan mountains, which was known as the hump. And we were actually using B-29s as cargo aircraft. This is not a really good use of aircraft. Uh, so again, only even the Chinese have lost so much territory that even by this time, even the B-29 can only get to Kyushu from uh, China. The raids are very ineffective. Uh, again, there's terrible weather. Japan, particularly in the summertime, is very cloudy, so you, it's very difficult to have visual bombing. Um, the raids are very small because it's impossible to get enough supplies into China to have these you know, to carry large bomb loads and, and to get everything they need, everything is flown in. It's not an effective methodology to have this thing working. And again, you've got the weapons problems, you've got engine failures, you've got a whole new aircraft that's buggy at best. You know, it's got a lot of what they would term in World War II as gremlins. You may have heard that term. So. They do, and though, do launch a raid on Hankow, China, which is in China, so it's a lot closer, and they can carry, therefore, more, less fuel and more bombs, and they decide to do a fire raid. And the incendiary raid on Hankow is extremely effective. Well, all right, a couple things with this map. First thing, I have no idea why they don't show Korea as part of Japan. I have no idea, but people, this comes up, and I don't know why this map is done that way, but remember, Korea is part of Japan. All right, so if you see on the left here, this area here is not conquered by the Japanese until late in 1944, when they launched the largest offensive of the war for the Japanese. Uh, nearly a million Japanese decide that they're going to take this area here. And the reason they're going to do that is 
one, to drive the B-29s further away from Japan, and two, because we have cut off the supplies by ocean, as you may remember, we owned the Philippines, so now they can't bring supplies by water, they're going to make a rail line from Indonesia, excuse me, from uh, Vietnam, for, so they can get stuff from Indonesia, Brunei, et cetera, to Vietnam, and then they're going to take it by rail all the way to Korea and then go from Korea to Japan by ship. And that's their goal, is to try to resupply Japan in that method. It's, of course, it's impossible to ship enough oil doing that that way, but at least they're trying to get some goods from the southern resource area because it's cut off. Well, the, the B-29s are so ineffective because of, they can't hit the targets. Uh, the, what they do is they decide that we, under the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army Air Force, goes to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and say, you know, what we'd really like to do is we'd like to have some new bases and really be good if we could get Saipan. So if we took Saipan, we could stage the B-29s on Saipan, and then we'd be well within range, as you can see the arrow, of Japan. And best of all, we can supply Saipan by ship, so we can bring in all the bombs, all the fuel, and, as you may remember, all those engines that burn out. And we can bring them right in, and we then don't have to worry about flying over the Himalayas and bringing in things, and have, we can have much bigger and much more effective bombing raids. So indeed, that's what we do. I love this picture. I think the rest of this lecture I'm going to do this. <laughs> you may see this map. I mean, if that's not a staged picture, I don't know what is. But uh, so Hansel is now in charge of the B-29s in uh, Saipan. And he's going to have the first raid on Tokyo. But of course, we cannot get fighters there. It's too far away. So we're going to hit bottleneck targets. We're going to do what we always wanted to do. And we're hoping that that bottleneck target will be the Japanese aircraft en engine factories, particularly the engines. It's the aircraft factories in general. But the number one factories they're going after is where the Japanese create aircraft engines. Well, if we can do that, we'll have complete air superiority over Japan, and we will be able to then do whatever we want to over Japan. Well, it doesn't quite work out because once again, the weather is lousy. You can't see what you're trying to hit. So visual bombing is imp almost impossible. On the first mission, only 24 of 111 B-29s actually bomb their primary target. The other problem is we're launching these attacks from very high altitude because we have to stay away from Japanese fighters and daylight at precision raids. And that contributes to the engines burning up. That contributes to carrying more fuel because you have to gain all that altitude. And they encounter the thing called the jet stream. And the jet stream at 130 miles an hour, when you drop bombs from 32,000 feet and they hit the jet stream, it kind of tends to scatter the bombs. So they have that huge problem as well. So they can't get the accuracy they need. <laughs> well, Hansel gets fired, <laughs> and they bring in this guy, General Curtis LeMay, and he is an amazing character uh, because he's what they call in the Air Force an operator. And what does that mean? He's a guy that doesn't, isn't a planner, isn't a, you know, a strategic thinker. He's a guy that just gets stuff done. And he's really good at this. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Dr. Strangelove, he's portrayed in that movie as a general Jack D. Ripper. And he also, as you and Alabamians, I'm sure all know, did run with uh, Governor George Wallace as his vice president. Uh, in Wallace's attempt to win the White House. 
by the way, he always had a cigar in his mouth because he had a, a, a facial problem. So he used the cigar to keep his, uh, he, he had a, like a palsy. So he would keep the cigar in his mouth if, so people didn't know that. Uh, he had tremendous success over Germany. He created numerous, I won't go into this in detail, but he created numerous new ideas for us to, to fly daylight combat missions. He was very successful. Uh, he gets to uh, Saipan and Tinian and Guam, where he's taken over the, the 20th Air Force, and he begins to improve maintenance. He's getting more planes over the target. He improves morale, but the results still suck. Because again, the jet stream, clouds, all this plays against it. So what's going on is, is that we're not getting what we need for results. And as the war progresses, things just become more and more ugly. That's the best way I can put this. For example, when the Germans begin to use the V1 and V2 rockets and uh, I guess you would call it a, a rocket plane, the V1, it's not really a, a ICBM or an IRBM. Um, British are very angry by this, particularly Winston Churchill. He's so angry that he proposes that they be, have the RAF begin to drop poison gas on German cities. Fortunately, the British government and the US government talk him out of this plan because they literally were intending to drop poison gas on German civilians. That's how angry they were about those attacks. <coughs> the Air Force also realizes that they spent $3 billion making the B-29. They want to be an independent force, and this thing can't fail. It's got to succeed one way or another. So Arnold, Hap Arnold, who's in charge of the Army Air Force at this time, sends this order out. He goes, you know, it's really important that we know the effects of firebombing on Japanese cities. And strangely enough, we just happen to have a large stockpile of incendiary bombs in Saipan and Tinian and Guam. Funny how that works out. So the question is, is really, we always intended to, to burn Japanese cities. Otherwise, we would not have bothered to bring all those bombs to the middle of the Pacific. So LeMay is under pressure. He knows that he's got to make the B-29 succeed. It's not succeeding, even though with his best results, and he's got to achieve the goals of the Air Force. So he decides that what he's going to do is he's going to come in at night. He's going to use radar bombing, and there will be absolutely no attempt at precision. He's going to send in so many bombers in such a compact formation that they will overwhelm Japanese defenses and Japanese firefighters. He's going to strip the bombers of weight. He's going to take out all the defensive armament except the tail guns. He is going to take all the crew members that operated those guns and leave them on the ground. He's going to bring those bombers in super low so they need to carry less fuel and can carry more bombs. And consequently, they will not put so much strain on those engines to climb to 32,000 feet. So there's also another piece with this. He finds out that the Japanese have a gap in their anti-aircraft defenses. Their main anti-aircraft defenses are 75 millimeter to 120 millimeter guns, which fire a few rounds at a time. They're not automatic. And if a plane's high in the sky, you can continue to track it. Their light anti-aircraft gun is a 25 millimeter gun, which is a very ineffective weapon in general, but is completely ineffective at 5,000 feet and above. So LeMay says, what we're going to do is we're going to fly in between five and 7,000 feet. So the big guns don't have enough time to track the bombers. The little guns, the bombers are just out of range. 
and the Japanese have no significant capability of night fighters. They don't have a lot of radar equipped night fighters like we do and the Germans do. So he is going to exploit this AAA gap, uh, AAA being anti-aircraft artillery. He does this on his own authority. He does not inform Hap Arnold until the day before the raid. The crews of his aircraft, they're panicked. They're terrified of this. They've been trained and been told that they need to come in at 32,000 feet. Now he's telling them that you're going to come in at 5,000 to 7,000 feet, and oh, by the way, we're going to take all the guns off your planes. So the crews are very, very frightened by this whole thing. Well, what are we going to use to burn down Japanese cities? And we're going to use this thing. This is the M69 incendiary cluster bomb. And I'm going to send you a video on this, by the way. Uh, I'll do that uh, today or tomorrow. And what this thing is, as you can see on the right, is they take a bunch of these sticks, 38 of these little sticks, and put them into this cluster. And the cluster bomb drops, and at 2,000 feet, it busts open. And these 38 little sticks come flying out. Now, how does an iron pipe like this go to the ground in any sort of reasonable way? Well, what happens is, is a little, like a kite tail comes out of the back. So it doesn't have fins or anything. It just has a, like a piece of cloth comes out of the back of it. And that guides this thing down in some sort of way, not particularly good, but at least it keeps the nose down. Now, what is this thing? It has about two and a half pounds of napalm in a cheesecloth sack. When it hits the ground, about three to five seconds later, a magnesium charge goes off and blows globs of napalm out of the back of that tail. So it starts to splatter and stick on things. Well, this thing is proven to be the most effective weapon against the Japanese uh, as far as an incendiary that there possibly could be. We actually test this on a fake Japanese village that we build in Nevada. And it's, it's, think this through now. You got a B-29 standard armament is 40 of these cluster bombs. When they burst open, it releases 1,520 of these M69s, one plane. Well, we begin to firebomb Tokyo, and you can see here is the remnants of Tokyo after the, uh, this bombing. There is nothing standing except for concrete buildings. We take off 325 B-29s, 86% bomb the primary target, they drop 1,655 tons of bombs on Tokyo, mostly M69 incendiaries. So you can just start trying to do the math on how many of those M69s actually hit the city. <coughs> Japanese firefighters are completely overwhelmed. They don't have a chance. And once again, it's dry, it's hot, and it's windy. And a giant firestorm breaks out in Tokyo. It burns down in one night 16 square miles of Tokyo. Casualties are 80 to 100,000 dead. And it is probably to a million homeless. And to this day, even with atomic weapons, this may be the single most deadly attack in, in history, done with conventional planes. Well, for the next 10 days, LeMay goes on a bombing terror using these tactics, similar tactics. And he continues to burn out Japanese cities until he literally runs out of incendiaries to drop on them. You can see here, this city, again, completely burned. There's nothing standing except concrete buildings. Everything is burnt to the ground. On March 14th, the Air Force sends LeMay a message, says, hey, you know, editorial comments are starting to come out that this is starting to look a lot like area bombing and not precision bombing. And 
you need to reinforce that thinking that this indeed is not area, area bombing. This is precision bombing. And you need to guard against anyone stating this is area bombing. And what is happening is, is particularly amongst the U.S. religious uh, community, pastors and religious leaders are beginning to see that this is perhaps getting a little out of hand. So there is some concern. And so there is beginning to be some protest, not much, but some protest in the U.S. about area bombing. Uh, the Japanese are trying to respond to this uh, using 120 millimeter uh, guns. They begin to tear down sections of their cities so that they can um, prevent the fires from spreading. They begin to disperse their industry, which is in order to preserve their industry, but when you disperse your industry, you're not making anything. So consequently, their production levels begin to fall rapidly. Uh, they're going to have, you may remember I mentioned Guretsu. Guretsu are uh, Japanese suicide uh, airborne troops. They were going to have a huge Guretsu raid of 200 aircraft on Saipan. Our code breakers once again come to the rescue and we destroy those aircraft on the ground using U.S. carrier forces. And consequently, they don't get that attack in to attack Saipan. Uh, the Japanese decide at this point that they're going to husband all their fighting aircraft that they have left and they're not going to defend their cities. They're going to keep their aircraft strictly to be used as kamikazes. So the Japanese population is now left to their own devices. They have no protection. So, and I'll make this brief. Uh, Japan had this thing in 1942 with the Doolittle Raid. I'll send you out a, a thing on the Doolittle Raid. I'm not going to go into it today. But the Doolittle Raid took place in 42, in spring of 42. Uh, and we bombed uh, Tokyo and a few other Japanese cities, just 15 planes. But <laughs> the Japanese were very, very unhappy about this, that we had the audacity to bomb their cities. And in retaliation, they came up with the Japan's Enemy Airmen's Act of 1942. For example, they're not going to treat enemy airmen that are dropping bombs on cities as POWs. They're going to treat them as criminals. So anyone who commits or any all the following shall be subject to military punishment. And the first piece is bombing, strafing, or otherwise attacking civilians with the objective of cowing, intimidating, killing, or maiming them. The second piece is bombing, strafing, or otherwise attacking private properties with the objective of destroying or damaging private property. What are the penalties for this? Military punishment should be the death penalty, life imprisonment, or a minimum of 10 years. So if you're captured bombing a Japanese city, this is what their intentions are. So any airmen that were captured over Japan were subject to this. They were subject to beatings, torture, and most actually died. Uh, the Japanese did burn most of their records at the end of World War II. Uh, there is significant documentation of this, uh, that they were ordered to burn their records, so there is no accounting for the amount of airmen that were killed by this uh, method. So there's just no way to know, because they burned all their records. What few that they were able to prove uh, where they did things like they dug up graves and found out that the, uh, the airmen had been beheaded, for example. So they knew that wasn't because of a crash. Uh, they would have war crime trials for some of these Japanese that took part in these atrocities. And there is good documentation that indeed the Japanese, had we invaded, invaded Japan proper, they would have killed all of the POWs they had, approximately, I think, 170,000, not just the U.S. Approximately 170,000 POWs of all types, British, Indian, Australian, U.S. I think there were 15,000 U.S. of that 160,000. <coughs> all right, so the next piece is Operation Starvation, and this is another use of the B-29. Uh, they are going to use the B-29 to mine Japanese harbors. 
This is the Inland Sea. That is the number one way for the Japanese to transport goods and services amongst the home islands. So they get 80% of oil, 88% of their iron ore, 20% of their 24% of coal, coking coal, food, pretty much everything that they have, 75% of their total commerce sails on that inland sea. Well, we know all about this, and we are going to use the B-29 to mine this area. The Army Air Force is not particularly want to do this. Uh, they don't think this is what their bombers are for, but they are talked into it, and eventually LeMay becomes a big supporter of this. So, in six months, they dropped 1,000, or excuse me, 13,102 mines of various types. There was magnetic mines, there are pressure mines, and there are acoustic mines, or multiples of each type within a single mine. A pressure mine, for example, if a ship goes over, it disturbs the water above it, changes the water pressure, and that sets off the mine. A magnetic mine, the magnetic field of the ship sets off the mine. The propeller noise, when it comes in because of the Doppler effect, when it gets close, it hears a certain way. When it begins to lose, recede, if it's loud enough, it will set off the mine. So there's multiple ways for these mines to be set off. They're hard to sweep because they have a thing called a delay counter. So some of the mines, the first time you go over them, they blow up. Some of the mines, you have to go over them three or four or five times before they go up. So these mines are very, very difficult, particularly the pressure mines are almost impossible to sweep. Yes? What percentage of these mines blow up on impact into the water? I know they've got parachutes, but there's still some degree of speed when they hit the water. The question is, is do any of these mines blow up when they hit the water? And the answer would be no. They're made to be dropped. So no, that's not an issue. They, they go to the bottom. They have, frequently have timers, and once the timer goes off, then they, then they become active. That doesn't mean that they don't fail. I'm sure many of them did. But. So they blocked the Shimonose Shimonoseki Strait, which is the key entranceway into the Inland Sea from Korea. And they start to paralyze Japanese shipping. They become the most single effective method of destroying the Japanese shipping. We lost 15 planes putting these mines down. They sink or damage 670 ships. Uh, Kobe, for example, the shipping goes from uh, 320,000 tons to 44,000 tons a month. So they lose 85% of their shipping for one of their key ports. These mines destroy 1.25 million tons of shipping for a loss of 15 planes. It's incredibly effective. And by the way, we helped the Japanese sweep these mines until 1946, and then basically said, well, hey, guys, you're on your own after this. And they were still sweeping these mines into the 1980s. And the pressure mines, what they would do is they would take a little tiny ship, an old ship, and push it ahead, and it would set off the mine, and then it would sink the ship. So within sweeping these mines, they lost another 450 ships. U.S. carriers are, and battleships are, are, going, are involved with this. We now literally have our battleships off the coast of Japan shelling Japanese towns and cities, because the Japanese are powerless to stop us. Um, we have, uh, we're beginning to use uh, carrier aircraft to, to attack a strategic targets. They begin to attack aircraft factories and are very, very effective at it. Um, they begin to attack these things called train ferries. There's trains to get from the island of Hokkaido, the northern island where there's coal and food, to get to Honshu, come in on these 12 train ferries. They sink 10 of these 12 train ferries and damage the other two. So now there is no rail shipping from the island of Hokkaido to the island of Honshu whatsoever. Completely cut it off. Perhaps the most effective single raid in history. All right, so what have we done to the Japanese cities? If you look at this map, it is fairly impressive. For example, the 
dark part is the entire amount of Tokyo, Yokohama, and Kawasaki. The red part is what we have burned to the ground. Nagoya, the entire center of the city gone. Kobe, almost the entire city gone. So we have attacked 59 smaller cities and burnt to the ground 76 square miles of Japanese towns. The five largest cities, we destroyed 99 square miles. So total area is 100 and I think my math's actually, yeah, 175 square miles of Japanese cities are destroyed, square miles. So the B-29 force is growing. It will be over 1,000 aircraft by the November of 45 when we were going to have the invasion. And they will have the capability of dropping 80,000 tons of bombs a month on Japan, just from the B-29s. We also have the 8th Air Force coming in. So major, major amount of damage. So the, we are literally running out of cities to bomb. So our next effort is going to be to bomb Japanese transportation. We are going to destroy the Japanese railroads. They don't have a lot of roads, so most of their shipping, again, is through the, on water. The other major piece they have is they can ship on railroads. Well, we are now going to begin to destroy the railroads. Once we destroy the railroads, the Japanese will no longer be able to move food to their civilians. And consequently, we'll have a major issue of starvation in Japan. So food production is down 28% from pre-war levels. They can no longer get fertilizer from the Asian mainland. And also, our bombing has destroyed 25% of the total amount of rice storage in the city of Tokyo. When we get to the last class, we'll have the actual numbers on, on starvation. So it can be argued that because we isolated Japan with our Navy, and they could no longer get any goods to make things with, because they don't really have a lot of capability, to, they don't have a lot of iron ore or whatever, that there was no purpose in burning the cities down. It can be, an argument can be made, and it does, it does ring true, the fact you can't make anything if you don't have anything to make it with. You can have all the factories in the world, but if you don't have oil, you don't have iron ore, you don't have whatever, you can't make anything. Bombing does have a huge political value. Uh, again, by July, we would drop leaflets on Japanese cities and say, you know, you better get out of Dodge because here's what's going to happen. We're going to burn your city to the ground in a couple of days. And we would because they couldn't stop us. We would literally tell the population of Japan that we were going to burn their city down and give them warning. So when the United States Strategic Bombing Survey asked after the war when the Japanese people thought the war was lost, their number one answer was because of US bombing of Japanese cities. That's when they realized that the war was lost. <clears throat> the B-29s and other allied air power were the most visible single weapon to not just the Japanese people, but to the Japanese government. So the Japanese government knows that they've left their population willingly to its fate. And their number one fear, as I mentioned last week, is that the Japanese population will lose faith in the government and demand peace and the end of the government. So with that, uh, next week will be our last class. I will send you a couple of uh, videos, uh, hopefully today or uh, tomorrow, that will tie in with this class. And hopefully uh, next class, uh, it's, I'll put it this way, it's always darkest before the dawn. So thank you very much. <laughs>